Good morning and welcome to the Worthington Enterprises fourth quarter fiscal 2024 earnings conference call. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer session of the call. This conference is being recorded at the request of Worthington Enterprises. If anyone objects, you may disconnect at this time. I'd like to introduce Marcus Rogier, Treasurer and Investor Relations Officer. Mr. Rogier, you may begin. Thank you, Krista. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Worthington Enterprises fourth quarter fiscal 2024 earnings call. On our call today, we have Andy Rose, Worthington's President and Chief Executive Officer, and Joe Hayek, Worthington's Chief Financial and Operations Officer. Before we get started, I'd like to note that certain statements made today are forward-looking within the meaning of the 1995 Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. These statements are subject to risk and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ from those suggested. We issued our earnings release yesterday after the market closed. Please refer to it for more detail on those factors that could cause actual results to differ materially. In addition, our discussion today will include non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of these measures with the most appropriate comparable GAAP measure is included in the earnings press release, which is available on our investor relations website. Today's call is being recorded and a replay will be made available later on our website. At this point, I will turn the call over to Andy for opening remarks. Thank you, Marcus, and good morning. I want to welcome you to Worthington Enterprises fiscal fourth quarter earnings call. We had a respectable quarter with adjusted EBITDA of $63 million and adjusted earnings per share of $0.74. Cents. We also had a busy quarter on the M&A front, further executing on our strategy and positioning our portfolio for long-term success. The last year and a half was a lot of work positioning us as a standalone business, but our teams have transitioned well to driving towards above-market growth through innovation and M&A. I could not be more proud of the continued focus and hard work that our people carry out every day. We recently announced two transactions, the acquisition of Hexagon Regasco and the formation of a joint venture of our sustainable energy solutions business with Hexagon Composites. Both transactions are great examples of how we are good stewards of capital and create long-term value for our shareholders. First, we acquired Hexagon Regasco, a global market leader in lightweight composite liquefied propane gas cylinders used for leisure, household, and industrial applications. Hexagon Regasco pioneered composite technology for liquid gas cylinders in 2000, and with its highly automated manufacturing facility in Norway, today makes the most efficiently produced and quality consistent composite LPG cylinder in the world, selling into 100 countries. This acquisition is now part of our building product segment and complements our operations in Portugal, expands our product portfolio, and extends our global reach. Second, we also announced the formation of a joint venture of our sustainable energy solutions business with Hexagon Composites, the global leader in the storage and transport of hydrogen and compressed natural gas. Worthington has a long history of establishing joint ventures with strong partners to make a business better and maximize long-term value creation. The hydrogen market has been slow to develop in the U.S. and Europe, and this partnership will provide a better platform to capitalize on opportunities as they emerge. Our remaining ownership interest will no longer be reported on a consolidated basis, but rather earnings will flow through equity income. This strategic move results in a reduction of invested capital, higher earnings, and the prospect of a brighter future for our SES business. I would like to welcome the entire Hexagon Regasco team to Worthington Enterprises, and we are already working hard alongside the Hexagon Composites team to maximize the potential of our newly formed JV. The changes above mean our consumer products and building products businesses are now the primary pillars of Worthington Enterprises. We will continue to implement the Worthington business system of transformation, innovation, and M&A to enable us to achieve accelerated growth and earnings. We are particularly focused today on further enhancing our innovation capabilities so we can bring more and better products to market faster and incorporate sustainable technologies that will deliver significant value to our customers and make us a more valuable partner. As evidence, in collaboration with our customer Gulp, our Nexi IoT solution series recently received a design award 
from the IF Design Foundation and won gold in the business to consumer household appliance category from the renowned German Innovation Awards. Additionally, our Halo Elite Series Griddle was recognized as the best grills of 2024 by CNET and one of the 10 best grills of the year by the Wall Street Journal. Our expertise in strategic M&A, which is showcased by the Hexagon transactions, will help us drive growth and higher returns as we add new products, new brands, and consolidate markets. We will continue to be disciplined stewards of capital, not only making new investments to deliver long-term value creation, but also redeploying capital in situations where we can earn a better return. There is no better example of this than the transactions just completed. We're off to a good start as Worthington Enterprises, and Joe will now walk you through the numbers. Joe? Thank you, Andy, and good morning, everybody. On a gap basis, in Q4, we reported a loss from continuing operations of $0.64 cents a share and versus earnings of $1.01 per share in the prior year. There were several unique items that impacted our quarterly results, including the following. We incurred pre-tax restructuring, impairment, and one-time charges of $74 million, or $1.38 per share, during the current quarter. These charges were primarily related to the sale of 51% of our sustainable energy solutions segment as part of the formation of a joint venture with Hexagon Composites, a global leader in the clean energy space. Results in the prior year quarter were negatively impacted by $0.18 cents per share due to several items, largest being corporate costs that were eliminated at the time of separation along with costs related to the separation of our steel processing business and other smaller non-recurring items. Excluding these items, we generated adjusted earnings from continuing operations of $0.74 cents per share in the current quarter compared to $1.19 per share in Q4 of last year. Consolidated net sales in the quarter of $319 million decreased 13.6% from $369 million in the prior year due to lower volumes across all of our segments, compared to a very strong Q4 last year. Gross profit for the quarter decreased to $79 million from $94 million in Q4 a year ago. Despite the lower volumes, gross margin decreased only slightly to 24.8% from 25.5% and was up sequentially. Adjusted EBITDA in Q4 was $63 million, down from $94 million in Q4 of last year, and our trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA is now $251 million, with a trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA margin of 20.1%. With respect to cash flows and our balance sheet, cash flows from operations was $45 million in the quarter, and free cash flow was $34 million. During the quarter, we invested $11 million on capital projects, which included $5 million related to the previously mentioned facility modernization projects. We spent $12 million on acquisitions, which was primarily a deposit for the Hexagon Regasco acquisition, which closed on June the 3rd, and we paid $8 million in dividends. We also received $43 million in dividends from our unconsolidated JVs during the quarter, a 106% cash conversion rate on that equity income. For the full fiscal year, we spent approximately $19 million in CapEx related to the facility modernization projects, and we have about $60 million remaining to spend on those projects, which will be spread out over the next two years, and they're expected to be completed by early fiscal 2027. Looking at our balance sheet and liquidity positions, we ended the quarter with an exceptionally strong balance sheet, $298 million of long-term funded debt carrying an average interest rate of 3.6%, combined with $244 million of cash, yielding around 5%. We used approximately $84 million of this cash in early June to complete the Hexagon Regasco acquisition, net of proceeds that we received from Hexagon related to the JV's formation. Continue to operate with extremely low leverage, ending the quarter with a net debt to trailing EBITDA leverage ratio of less than a quarter turn, and we are well positioned with ample liquidity including a $500 million undrawn bank credit facility. Yesterday, the Worthington Enterprises Board declared a dividend of $0.17 cents per share for the quarter, which is payable in September of 2024. This is a 6% increase relative to the dividend last quarter, and we're very pleased to be able to continue rewarding our shareholders as we balance growth in our market-leading businesses with capital returns to shareholders. We'll now spend a few minutes on each of the businesses. In consumer products, net sales in Q4 were $125 million, down from $149 million a year ago. 
The decrease was a result of lower volumes, which were down 17.9% to Q4 of last year. Adjusted EBITDA for the consumer business was $17 million, and adjusted EBITDA margin was 13.6% in Q4, compared to $30 million and 19.8% in the prior year. The decline in adjusted EBITDA compared to the prior year quarter was primarily a result of lower volumes in our outdoor living products and slightly higher SG&A related to our tools business, as we are investing in that business for future growth. We had a tough comp relative to the prior year when that business generated record results, but we also believe that consumers have pulled back on discretionary purchases, and as we discussed last quarter, Q4 was also negatively impacted by volume that was pulled forward into Q3. While there are indications that consumers continue to be challenged by inflation and are spending less on non-essentials, the median age of a home in the U.S. is now over 40 years, and long-term trends favor companies with innovative tools and solutions used to repair and maintain those homes. In addition, our outdoor living products continue to win praise from publications and consumers, and we believe destocking has run its course and demand for those products moving forward will be more correlated with point-of-sale results. We have a solid lineup of market-leading brands that are an important and affordable part of outdoor living activities, celebrations, and home improvement projects, and we remain optimistic heading into our new fiscal year. Building products generated net sales of $154 million in Q4, down 12% from $175 million a year ago. The decrease was driven by a less favorable product mix and lower volumes, especially in the large format heating end market, which continued to see some destocking. We are optimistic that this destocking cycle will run its course this summer and demand will return to a more normal seasonal, seasonal normally levels in time for the fall heating season. Our water business continued to improve on the top and bottom lines and our cooling and construction products have returned to seasonally normal volumes as well. Voting products generated adjusted EBITDA of 52 million in the quarter and adjusted EBITDA margin was 33.6% compared to 65 million and 37.1% in Q4 of last year. The decrease was largely driven by lower equity earnings at Clark Dietrich. (laughs) That team continues to do a great job taking care of its customers, but slightly lower volumes and pricing competition from regional players has created some margin compression for them. Clark Dietrich contributed 12 million for the quarter compared to a near record 25 million in the prior year quarter. Wave continued to deliver very strong results, seeing relative strength in volumes across multiple end markets and contributed equity earnings of $28 million in the quarter, up from $24 million a year ago. For the year, Wave generated record equity earnings of $103 million for us. The building products team has done a very good job managing through the destocking that occurred in fiscal 2024 while enhancing its value proposition for customers, and they are very well positioned as demand trends normalize. In Q4, Sustainable Energy Solutions generated net sales and adjusted EBITDA of $40 million and $1 million, compared to $45 million and $4 million a year ago. As I mentioned earlier, during the quarter, we sold an interest in our Sustainable Energy Solutions business to Hexagon Composites, effectively turning that business into an unconsolidated JV, of which we own 49%. This occurred on May the 29th, so Q4 and historical results for SES are being reported in other along with unallocated corporate expenses. Going forward, starting with our fiscal 2025 Q1, any profits or loss related to SES will flow through equity income within corporate and other. At this point, we're happy to take any questions that people might have. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw that question, again, press star one. Your first question comes from Katherine Thompson with Thompson Research Group. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. This is actually Brian Barros. I'm for Catherine. Thank you for taking my questions. Morning, Brian. uh, Morning. On uh, on Clark Easter, can I touch on it there in the the prepared remarks? You saw a big drop in the quarter. You mentioned March compression, competition. I guess maybe first off, can you parse out how much in that drop was price versus volume there and I know it was facing a tough comp overall anyway. And then maybe just touch on the outlook for that part as we kind of settle into this new level after coming off the COVID highs. Sure, Brian. So it, it, it wasn't all that related to volumes. Volumes were slightly down, but they, they hung in 
pretty well. It, it was, in fact, a margin compression story. And, um, you know, the I remember they're two-thirds new and, you know, steel prices fluctuating. Uh, there, there are people that, competitors that, that do different things. And so uh, they've done a great job, uh, you know, kind of maintaining share and, and taking care of their customers. You know, we look at this quarter and, you know, their performance this quarter as kind of feeling pretty troughy, um, you know, and so if you kind of annualize that, that, that should be reasonable. Got it. And then maybe on the, the building product segment, the you know, margins were down, again, mostly on Clark Dietrich, as you mentioned, but then see, if you back out the JVs, it looks like the, the core margins there for the building product segment held in pretty well, given the, the headwinds of everything you mentioned. I guess, can you just touch on the the puts and take there for the, the core building product margins? Yeah, it's, it, again, it feels where we are right now. I think it was 7.5% uh, EBITDA margins, X, XJVs. That, that also feels trophy. The, the higher margin products that we have are really where the destocking has been the most acute. And so you think about that kind of large uh, format heating market, um, this summer, we think that that destocking runs its course, and so when when the fall heating season cranks back up, uh, we anticipate you know some some more growth there and some return to normalcy, and that really ought to help uh, you know their their margins along with continued improvements in, in the water business and then in the cooling business. Yeah, I think Brian, you know, Joe's talked about in the past some of the opportunities, particularly in the in the water segment there, and we're, and we're starting to see the results of a lot of good work by the team in terms of in, improving the the profitability of that segment. So that probably helped during the quarter as well. Understood. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Sure. Your next question comes from the line of Susan McLaurie with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. This is Charles Perron in for Susan. Thanks for taking my question. Sure. Good morning, Charles. Good morning. Um, maybe first, can you expand on the Exagon Regasco acquisition? Maybe how you found this deal, that, that maybe the rationale behind behind the, the transaction, and the synergies you think you can generate from both revenue and, and cost? I think you noted that it extends your portfolio and, and geographic footprint. Any details you can provide on that? Yeah, I mean... Joe can maybe give you some details about where the transaction came from, but it was, you know, the Hexagon announced publicly they were going to put the business up for sale um, last year. And so we were aware of it. And, and honestly, it's a, it's a perfect strategic fit for us because we're one, we're already in the business in Europe and Hexagon is the clear market leader in type four for this type of product. So um, there are there are and will be synergies for us. We, I don't think we've said sort of publicly because we have to get in and understand the business better. But one of the things that I will tell you is already happening is, you know, this is probably the most automated cylinder manufacturing plant in the world. And uh, not all, it's probably hard to measure a synergy here, but they're going to be able to help us with some of our existing operations in terms of bringing technologies and, and processes that they already have. So um, not only is, a great, is it a great product and they're um, a market leader in, in the product set that they have, but there should be some benefits to us as well. Yeah, and Charles, Andy, Andy's absolutely right. The, um, you know, the conversation started, honestly, around the Regasco business, but um, Hexagon, Composites is, is 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 a great company in you know the clean energy space, and so the you know the, the conversation morphed and grew into ultimately one that included the JV, and uh, we you know, we couldn't be happier with the, the 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 team and the people and and the cultural similarities between Hexagon and Worthington, and so uh, this was really this was really kind of the only company on the planet that we could have done these transactions with and it, it, it's it's early right it's only kind of three and a half weeks in but uh so far so good on both fronts 
Got got it. Thanks for the caller. Um, and maybe can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing on the consumer segment? I was a little bit surprised by the volume decreased this quarter, I think 16%. But what are you hearing from your customers and, and demand for your consumer product entering the summer months? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. You know, we, we talked about this some um, in, in Q3, but the, the folks that we follow, and I know that you guys keep track of, Charles, um, you know, have all sort of suggested that there is some softness in consumer spending, um, particularly in kind of the outdoor living spaces, which is really primarily where the decrease in volumes were. But, you know, in December, January, February, uh, we almost became a victim of our own success because there were there were the storms and there was that very cold weather and our and our retail customers needed uh, additional supply and and needed kind of surge volumes and we were in a position uh, because of some of the good work of the consumer team to be able to provide those additional camping gas cylinders and other. Uh, products to them, and and then they were effectively full uh, in Q4. And so, what normally what you would have seen is a little bit of a slower Q3 and a stronger Q4. You know, that was flipped on its head this year. Um, I, I will tell you that you know, and I think Andy mentioned this earlier. It's it's almost as if there's still some dislocation and some kind of different factors that are influencing seasonality as as things continue to get back to normal from covid uh but you know but as you know soft as those sales were in in q4 they were far softer than they normally are we didn't lose market share uh you know nothing would have happened in in that regard and thus far again it's only three and a half weeks um, volumes there uh, have in the outdoor living space have, have have bounced back to pretty close to normal. Got it. That's very good color, Joe. Thank you very much for the time. Sure. Thanks, Charles. Your next question comes from the line of Daniel Moore with CJS Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. I uh, appreciate you taking questions. Um, good morning, Daniel. Hello, and Clark Dietrich. Good morning. Uh, maybe just talk a little bit about the demand and activity levels, um, you know, at both Wave and Clark Dietrich on a forward-looking basis. Um, and then, you know, for Clark Dietrich, you mentioned this kind of feels like it's troughing here. Um, how do we think about, you know, your expectations for profitability for Wave um, over the next several quarters as well? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we've talked about this in past quarters. You know, these businesses, even though they're both, Sort of commercial construction related are a little bit different in a little bit different places in the cycle. Clark Dietrich is more on the front end of construction wave, a little bit more on the back end of construction. Um, you know, there's probably a few, <laughs> it's a little bit confusing in terms of the demand profile for these businesses, but I would say overall, right now, demand is basically steady. I mean, you know, quarter to quarter, it may be up, maybe down in each of these businesses, but, um, you know, there is, there, there is some change in the steel price market right now it's declining. And so both of these businesses are, are currently selling sort of higher price steel. And so over the coming months, as steel prices come down, they'll have the benefit of lower price steel flowing through that also impacts price. And that's really what happened for Clark Dietrich in this quarter is when steel prices start to decline, the market for, metal framing declines quite quickly. For Wave, it's a little bit stickier. And, you know, both teams are doing a good job of trying to maintain price in that environment. But, you know, as demand softens a little bit, it becomes more more difficult for them. But, you know, we feel, you heard Joe mention earlier, we feel pretty good about both these businesses and their ability to kind of maintain profitability, profit levels going forward. Got it. Really helpful. And then, you know, you gave great color um, around, uh, you know, kind of state of the market for both consumer and building products. Do we think about the first quarter or two, you know, being a little softer on a year over year basis before starting to kind of, you know, take up in the fall? Is that the right way to kind of think about cadence as we as we look out, um, you know, first half of fiscal 25 and into the balance of the year? Yeah, I, I think I think that probably depends a little bit, Dan. I mean, I think there are 
certain product lines or value streams for us where, where that would be true, you know, and there are others that are on a little bit of a, a different trajectory. So, uh, you know, a, a little bit of, of a mixed bag, but, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, the, the headwinds that have been out and around uh, haven't gotten worse. You know, I don't think they've gotten materially better. Uh, and so we're, we're comfortable certainly operating in the environments that we're in and our, our teams are working hard to, to be nimble and to, you know, continue to enhance their value propositions and, you know, take share when they can. And, and as demand trends normalize, they, they, they feel like and we feel like they're in pretty good shape. Yeah, I, I don't, <clears throat> it's hard to forecast what the economy is going to do, but, you know, there's sort of pluses and minuses that I think are impacting our businesses in material ways. One, obviously, we have a lot of infrastructure spending from the government that's still sort of coming through the pipeline. That's a positive. We have interest rates, which is impacting the housing market and, you know, slowing repair and remodel there. That's that's obviously a negative. Employment is obviously holding up pretty good. Um, but consumers are sort of dialing back some of their discretionary spend. So I don't know whether that's, <laughs> that's a neutral, um, financial markets are still pretty strong. So there's sort of puts and takes that, you know, at least from my vantage point solve for kind of, you know, somewhat of a steady economy with, you know, a little bit of noise here and there and different, different products and different markets. Really helpful. And the last one for me, just in terms of the, the JV, um, or, or, you know, the agreement with Hexagon uh, for your sustainable energy solutions business, you know, how does that enhance your competitive position as well as, you know, the kind of organic growth and, and maybe margin potential on a longer term basis? Thanks again for the question. Sure. Dave. So I, I think you're, you're asking about the margin profiles for FCS, you know, for, for, yeah. for us, for... <laughs> On a combined basis, with your, uh, you know, your as a, you know, equity owner as opposed to owning the overall, but but what does uh, you know Hexagon bring to the table that might enhance, sure. you know, kind of the longer term opportunity? Thanks. Sure. So 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 what so what happens immediately, right, is is the revenue from SES through you know, drops out of our P and L, right? It's an unconsolidated JV, and their their profits or losses will roll through. Equity income, so I think that was 130, 140 million dollars in in revenue in you know, 2024, um, which which will now kind of essentially operate just through equity income. But you know that business got immediately better the day that we formed the JV. Uh, you know we, we really picked a, a fantastic partner. Hexagon is is is, is a leader. In that space, they they have terrific knowledge around Type Four, um, and really are on top of a lot of the things that are happening, you know, around the globe. And so, the the company will be managed, if you will, to maximize its own potential. Um, it does, what we did doesn't change the end market that they're operating in, and so so we still believe that the markets are are very attractive longer term, but it's going to take three plus years for those markets to really develop enough and mature enough to have that be, you know, a scalable, very profitable business. Uh, but with, with the addition of kind of Hexagon as a 49% owner along with us at 49%, and then you know, the local management team owning 2% of that JV, uh, we feel really good about their ability to operate in any environment and and hopefully drive you know meaningful share gains for the for the venture as we go forward. If you remember the history here, SES really started out as an industrial gas business, um, and we've made investments in Type Four, which is where Hexagon is a market leader. But we haven't been able to really optimize those investments, and so that's really where they're going to be able to sort of help with the transition. But you know, what's going on right now in that market is the hydrogen economy is slow to emerge and the type one market is slow, particularly in Europe, because of what's going on you know, with the European economies, the war in Russia and Ukraine. And so it's, it's you know, we, we're, we're excited to have a partner that's going to bring some expertise and, a, and some extra lift to the JV. Your next question comes from the line of John Tumazos with John Tumazos Very Independent Research. Please go ahead. Thank you. 
Could you explain a little more about the hexagon uh, composite business that you've acquired? Are they carbon fiber composites? Are they uh, fiber reinforced plastics? Are they laminates? Uh, how does it go to market? How will Worthington make it better? Yeah, so it's a type four cylinder, John, that essentially is in the um, propane market. That is the product that they're selling, which is a carbon fiber, um, I guess 100% carbon fiber with plastic wrapping cylinder. Um, so that's the basic product. The the market that they sell or markets that they sell into are very customized. So most of their customers have very specific pro- type of product that they're looking for, and so there's some some aspects that are customized in the manufacturing process. Um, you know, they go to market. They have their own sales force. Uh, they have uh, global coverage in terms of their marketplace. Although I would tell you that they don't sell a lot into the U.S. today. And so that's an opportunity where we can, we think we can help uh, leverage what they've already got on a global basis. So I don't know if that sort of hits your question, but feel free to follow up with, if not. Yeah, what John, is, John, I would, John, John the only for? thing I would add, sorry, John, the only, the only thing I would other, it add is, and he's absolutely right, it's a nicely profitable business. You know, they had 20-ish percent EBITDA margins in calendar 2023. Uh, and, you know, we make them better um, by a lot of the channels and a lot of the relationships that we have uh, in places. But I would also tell you, and this is what we look for in anything that is attractive to us from an M&A perspective, is, you know, they're going to make us better. Uh, you know, they they will absolutely complement our operations on the continent in Europe and Portugal very well. Um, and their expertise, and Andy, Andy mentioned this, their expertise in, in running uh, a, a very automated, high-class, world-class facility um, will help us globally with our own manufacturing footprint. What is type four? And is this something that might be preferred by mainstream consumers because it isn't as heavy when we pick it up at the grocery store? So if you if you think about where this gets sold and, and you think of maybe the comparison would be something you'd go to your exchange um, here in the States, right? You would you would take your steel cylinder, maybe it's made by, or maybe it's branded Blue Rhino Amerigas or somebody else, and you exchange that tank. In, in Europe, it, it's quite different. Um, and this these cylinders are used as the primary source of heating and cooking fuel in somebody's apartment or in somebody's home, right? They don't have natural gas lines running all over the place the way that we do here in the States. And so there is, uh, and the customers are primarily the gas companies who are then providing this service to their customers, the residents. And so there are people carrying these tanks up and down stairs uh, all over the place. And so weight matters quite a bit. And so this composite cylinder is far lighter than its steel equivalent is. It's more expensive, um, but it is, in a lot of cases, absolutely worth it for customers and for consumers. And so that's really uh, the reason that composite tanks have taken hold the way that they have. Thank you for the explanation. Sure. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from Brian McNamara with Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I guess morning, I'll try Brian. to ask about cons- Thanks, guys. I'll, I guess I'll ask, try to ask about consumer products, perhaps in a different way, given the big decline in volumes and sales. I know you guys flagged the pull forward last quarter, and then there's been the stocking as well. But we're each kind of worse than you thought. And I guess my, my bigger question is, should volumes be up this year, or are you expecting a drag similar to what we've seen in other outdoor businesses, which have felt quite a bit of pain over the last couple of years? Any color there would be helpful. Yeah, I think, you know, we've gone through a couple of unique years in this business, Brian, where 
we had a huge bump from COVID because people were camping and cooking and doing lots of things at home. Then we had sort of the destocking year where all of the retailers loaded up on product because sales were so high. And so we had an abnormally low year. And I think the, you know, the expectation is that this year, you know, we're starting to get back to kind of normal demand patterns or demand levels, which probably should be up a little bit from last year. Um, you know, the, the last two quarters, as Joe kind of touched on, have been uh, a little odd from a seasonality standpoint, but partly related to, you know, our ability to service retailers and load up their inventories in anticipation of storms and other things. And then, you know, it led to a little bit of softness this fourth quarter. So, you know, I would say, you know, overall, we feel like we're getting back to kind of a normalized pattern and a normalized demand level. I think, I may not get this number exactly right, but I think 45-ish, 46 million tanks a year kind of expectation, but we'll see. That's helpful. Thank you. I, it is, I appreciate the caller on the steel price declines impacting Clark Dietrich. I'm curious, is is that just a timing issue? And if so, how long does it typically take to catch up in certain terms of uh, historically for Clark Dietrich? So the, yeah, so steel prices decline and I think it gets a little um, kind of mucky from a, a competitive perspective, right? Because you're, you're having to buy forward based on what you believe your demand plan looks like. And so, yeah, there's probably a lag of, uh, you know, a few months. Right. Got it. That's helpful. And then finally, maybe another one for Joe. I'm curious what your view is the true earnings power of the business. This is a question I've gotten a lot since you guys split split from the steel company. You came in around 250 million in adjusted EBITDA, and we'll call it a noisy fiscal year. Is that a good starting run rate? Uh, are you under earning? Uh, if so, what are the, the primary near term drivers of margin expansion? Thank you. Sure. When when we talk about this internally, you know, for us to get where we want to go, which is not two hundred fifty one million dollars, is clearly higher than that on an annualized EBITDA basis. But we you know we need we need base business improvement. Um, that is, and we've talked about this. Not every single one of our businesses is running at full speed, and you know, we've got plans, and we're thinking um, constantly about ways to make those businesses better. The, the recovery we've seen and, and the earnings power of the water business is a great example of that. Uh, the second, second thing that we need, um, is, is just kind of, I'll call it a normalized operating environment, right? Between you know, every single one of our businesses and everything, one of our value streams had a COVID bump and either had, or is, you know, living through the tail end of kind of the COVID hangover as things, kind of get back to where they, they ought to be at a higher level. And so, you know, normal operating environment for us uh, doesn't have to be 0% interest rates and all that kind of stuff, but just, you know, the lack of a headwind can ultimately become a tailwind. Um, that, that ultimately will be a driver for us. And then us executing on our strategic growth drivers, right, continuing to innovate, continuing to leverage transformation to take cost out, and to drive margins higher, and and then ultimately to make really good, thoughtful, strategic M and A decisions. Andy mentioned this, and it's 100% true. The Regasco acquisition and the SES formation of a JV are two good examples of that. And so, um, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and you know, we don't, we can't tell you where our earnings ultimately, you know, should be in in a given period of time. But based on those factors, uh, we feel like we have a, a great team. And we, you know, we feel like we have all the tools. And so if we get, you know, a handful of those kind of hurdles, uh, you know, met, we ought to be able to grow from here. And you may, you may recall from Investor Day, you know, I think we said in our materials, you know, our goal is to grow 6 to 8% top line per year. You know, I would be disappointed if over the next three to five years we don't exceed that. Uh, you know, I certainly think we can grow at double-digit rates. Our goal is to get to 24% EBITDA margins, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different tools in our toolkit, and Joe mentioned some of them. Obviously, our transformation playbook, which is how we make our businesses better, launching new products that are innovative. You can 
typically get higher margins for those and then and then doing you know accretive m a transactions so I think we have strategies we have great teams we've got the ability to execute on those and if we do that you know we should we should be able to accomplish those goals over the next you know period of time you know short of what the economy does I, I have no idea but um, right now it feels pretty good great thanks a lot for the color guys sure this concludes the question and answer session, and I will now turn the call back over to Andy Rose, Chief Executive Officer, for closing remarks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, as I said last quarter, we are very proud of our history and who we are today, but we are excited about beginning the first full fiscal year as Worthington Enterprises. We have Excellent strategies being driven by an experienced and highly motivated team of professionals and significant available capital to drive returns for our shareholders. So we're excited about our future and appreciate you being here with us today. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation and you may now disconnect.